Hi and welcome to this live stream. I titled this live stream from Hadoop to real time analytics with uh, Drew Bob Bortucker. And I came to this live stream that somebody from Rockset actually a few months ago contacted me and like, Andreas, do you want to check out our platform? And you know me, I'm tinkering all the time with new stuff. So I looked at it and I really liked it. And then luckily I got uh, the opportunity to talk to Druba. So um, that's how this, how this came to play. Uh, I already see the first comment. So it seems like it's working. Yes. Hello, LinkedIn. So I'm going to bring Druba here on this stream and uh, do me a favor. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat and Druba and I were going to then chat about this and he's going to answer the questions most likely at the end. So let me bring Druba in. Hey Druba. Hey Andres, how are you? Fine, fine. Thanks for being here. Hey, how are thanks. you? Thanks a lot for getting me into your show. Really appreciate <laughs> it. Really nice to have you here. Um, I've been I've been looking into your LinkedIn profile and it said um, it said principal technical at Yahoo for yes. a founding architect and engineering lead HDFS. Then after that, it said uh, software engineer, Facebook scaling Hadoop clusters to tens of petabytes. Uh, co uh, co you contributed to core features of uh, HBase and deployed HBase there and founding engineer of RocksDB, which both are a, a key value store, H HBase and RocksDB, right? And now yes. a co founder at Rockset. So it, it's for me, it was immediately, ah, oh, I'm coming from the from the Hadoop, uh, like Hadoop area, I'm started my my uh, my career as in engineering uh, with Hadoop. So it, it's really, really nice that you're here and that we can have a yeah. chat. Yeah, Hadoop was very big, right? Um, it was fun working in that project. It was super fun. By the way, I have heard a lot of your previous podcasts especially related to Kafka and Docker and these ones, super interesting to me. Again, Thanks. I'm a data engineer by heart. So I try to follow a lot of new things that are happening in the data world. Now you, you're, for you, it's, it's always been the engineering uh, topic, right? Yes, I am very much a hands-on data engineer. Um, absolutely, yeah. So I work with Kafka as well uh, and many other data systems. But Hadoop was a really fun project. Uh, I can tell you all about it if people are interested. But yeah, I'll wait for you. How was how was how was working in that in that area? That was interesting at, question. At, at so this was yeah, this was like 15 years back, right? 2005 or 2006. Uh, and at that time, big data wasn't there. There was nothing called like big data or data engineering. There, this subject, data engineering, didn't exist, right? Uh, this is where there were engineers who were writing applications, but there was nothing. There was nobody saying that, okay, I deal with all these big data systems. But um, I remember that day uh, or like a few days there when Google published a paper called GFS. It's like the global file system, right? It's like a very seminal paper. I, I'm pretty sure most of your audience would be probably familiar with that paper. This came out in 2003, I think. And Google started this process of saying that, hey, we can accumulate petabytes of data or petabytes of data easily and make intelligence out of it. And Yahoo was falling behind at the time uh, because Google is just like picking up steam. And so this is why Yahoo decided to do the Hadoop project uh, in open source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think you're familiar, a lot of um, data systems now are open source, right? Kafka, another one, open source systems. And this is kind of Hadoop is the starting point. This is what essentially started this uh, movement where open source is useful for a lot of data systems afterwards, right? Everybody followed that step. Before that, there were not too many open source data systems out there. All databases um, yeah. couldn't really store that much data, but. Yeah. That was, that was specific? actually. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, go on. Uh, anything specific I can answer? I mean, those are very fun days and early days. There were like three people in that project. Okay. Uh, I joined. Uh, I joined and Yahoo kind of got Doug Cutting and uh, one another person to join the team, right? The Hadoop team. 
Um, and uh, I still remember the first engineer in the Yahoo search team who was the first user of Hadoop. Uh, he was an intern and in the Yahoo search team and that intern said, okay, I can use this Yahoo, this Hadoop software and see what, how I can use it. Cool. Um, so it was, it was quite interesting those days. Mm, amazing. Uh, it's uh, for me, like for, for me, it was, I, I was coming from the classical computer science, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, education. And I, I was familiar with relational databases. And for me, it was, I had actually a problem where a relational database was not the right choice. And so yes. I was looking around and then I, I, I found, I found, uh, Hadoop, I found HDFS, I found HBase. And that's for me was, was this, um, how I got in this. I saw in your LinkedIn that HDFS and before you were working on, on Andrew file system and Veritas file system. Yeah. Was that, was that a nice, I, I find this an interesting, a nice transition, like already working on, on this kind of, this kind of ideas or, or, or tools. Yeah. I was always interested in working on distributed data systems. Like when I graduated from my grad school at Wisconsin Madison, uh, I joined a startup called um, Transart Corporation. It was a small startup in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was building the distributed file system called Andrew File System. Huh. So this was way ahead of its time. I think Google didn't exist. This is, I'm talking about like 1990s, mid 1990s. Um, and um, there are big users of the distributed file system. And I was very interested in building data, data databases or file systems or storage systems. Um, and then this is kind of like you said, this is how I got into the pathway of building uh, Hadoop because um, Hadoop was revolutionary, I think, because it was the only system at the time where you can store petabytes of data. Huh. Uh, I'm guessing that's another reason why you might have got interested as well, right? Like there was a lot of write-ups from bigger website companies saying, hey, we are storing petabytes of data in Hadoop and there's no other system that could even store this much data, forget about like processing them or making sense out of it. Just storing yeah. one petabyte of data was, you couldn't store it in Oracle and say, okay, I can save my wallet. You will run out of money within a day, right? If you store from one petabyte yeah, of yeah, data yeah. in Oracle. Um, but, but yeah, you asked me about file systems. Uh, yeah, I definitely worked a lot on Veritas file system. Veritas file system was uh, a file system that was inside the operating system. I mean, it's a device driver. Um, and it was mostly used to make Oracle databases fa run faster. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but so, yeah, it's, it's interesting how data systems have evolved over time, I think, right? Like you said, like there's operating system things in the very early days, then Hadoop happened. And now there's not much Hadoop anymore because of some other reasons we can talk <laughs> about. But yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, I, I think the, how I saw it, like it was, it was Hadoop, it was HDFS, it was HBase and so on. And then people were moving more than a lot of other key value stores and, and, uh, and, uh, like time series database and everything was, was coming up, but it, it was a lot was still, uh, like you could, you could deploy it. You were, you were running it on your cluster or whatever. Right. I'm, I'm guessing with RocksDB, it was, was the same, right? That you, that you installed that's, it on, on hardware or on your. Yeah, that's memory. a good question. Yeah. That's a great question. So since you asked me about RocksDB, let me tell you a little bit about that story as well. Right. Um, so Hadoop started because disk disks were becoming cheap and so people can store a lot of data. So they needed a software saying that what software can I use? If I have all these hard disks, what software can I use to store data in these thousands or 10,000 hard disks, but RocksDB came from a different angle. So this is, um, I, I was at, at, I was an engineer at, at, at Facebook. I was a data engineer at Facebook, right? Uh, and I was building Hadoop systems at Facebook as well. But then I realized that the Hadoop systems are very batchy in nature, in the sense, mm -hmm. the queries are long running and the queries are what if, like, what if this person um, became friends with that person, right? So you can answer those kind of questions inside of Facebook. Uh, but rocks, so they're very batchy. So you could never get intelligent answers immediately, right? Like says a user uses the Facebook website. You cannot use Hadoop to power some intelligent feature in the app right then and there, right? So this is where RocksDB started. Um, I started the RocksDB project at, at Facebook in 2011, I guess. 
uh, and then got open source in 2012 or 2013. But the focus there was low latency queries. So how can you have a key value store on large data sets where the queries are fast? It doesn't have to be one hour or it doesn't have to take 10 minutes or it doesn't have to take five seconds. These queries in RocksDB are fast millisecond latency queries, which basically means that it can be used as a very interesting tool when building data applications that are user facing or that are customer facing, right? Mm -hmm. um, like if you're if you're firing up the Facebook web page or the Facebook app, you cannot wait more than maybe 500 milliseconds to before you see the data load, right? So this is where That's RocksDB came in the picture. Um, but yes, you are right. All of these are key value stores. Um, I also worked on HBase um, back when Facebook had an app called Facebook Messenger. This was at that time it was called Facebook Chat. It was. Mm -hmm like the granddaddy of Facebook Messenger or something like that. Uh, and that we used HBase for that in the first release, I guess in 2009. Um, and HBase was a data key value store built on top of the Hadoop file system. So this is this was some of the core contributions that I made to HBase was like data formats, uh, checksums, uh, how data is organized inside it, inside HBase so they can fetch it effectively. Um, but yeah, I mean, it has been a gradual progression of systems, data systems, I think, where Hadoop was very much batchy in nature, right? And then key value stores came up like HBase, but they're not fast enough. Uh, and then RocksDB, uh, finally, that I, that I helped build at Facebook was basically the one which was used for analytical applications, but is a user facing customer ap applications. Mm. So that's kind of the evolution of this database side of the story. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's interesting because that I, I found that also always the problem with, with Hadoop is you it was really good running big batch queries once a day, once an hour or whatever, but it wasn't really good to deliver quick quick value. Spark helped a bit on that, right? Where you said, okay, I'm doing a Hadoop cluster, I'm setting Spark on top of it and trying to get stuff quickly, but it was always like adding one more thing. It's, it That's made it more point. complex yeah. than, than That's a simple. great point that you bring in Spark. So again, the way I think about it is like Hadoop is very much batch system, like you mentioned, right? Spark is very much a streaming system, which basically means that when data comes in, you do some analytics uh, mm -hmm. and then produce some results. And that was the second step of the data journey. And the third and the current state of the data journey is more about real-time analytics, where you don't do too many things when data comes in, but you can actually do a lot of analytics when the user is requesting some an analytics to be done. You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So Spark and um, again, Kafka, these are great streaming systems. You can do a lot of things when data comes in and you get stored uh, for most of the streaming analytics, but for real time, um, you would see how, how real time analytics works, for example, um, let's say you're playing an online game, right? And then you have uh, like hundreds of players are playing a game and then you need a leaderboard on the side of the game. Like, am I the first person in this game right now or am I the 50th person in this list? Yeah. So that's an analytical query. It has to look at a lot of how you are playing, what you are doing, how many points have you accumulated and render you the leaderboard, right? So now this cannot be done as part of data coming in because it depends on how frequently you refresh your panels. So this is what I mean by, um, th there are various things. I mean, these are all tools to use uh, as a data engineer for different use cases. Um, but yeah, Spark and um, Apache Kafka, I think was kind of the software stacks that helped migrate Hadoop to more streaming fashion. Mm. Uh, and then lately I have seen a lot of systems which are very much going even beyond streaming systems and going more into real time systems. Now, the interesting thing is how you how you define real time analytics because you can think of this in 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 two ways the one like you said the user makes a query and this query basically gets or starts an analytical process in real time the other way would be personally I'm when I'm thinking when I'm coming from I'm coming from the streaming um, path. I'm always thinking of the the way data is coming in, and there immediately is getting getting some analytical results. So these great, are great, these are great. two things you have to actually keep in mind when somebody talks about that, because they That's can mean question. different things, right? 
they can live very different things. Actually, I can tell you a short story of how this evolved when I was at Facebook, right? Cool. So Facebook, um, I was a data engineer at Facebook for like probably nine or 10 years. So one of the projects was that it is called the Facebook news feed. Like when you fire up the Facebook app, you see all the posts, comments, likes from all your friends, right? Yeah. So in the very early days, um, what happened was that anytime you post a comment, that comment is actually published to the feed of all your friends. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So this is a streaming system. Every time you post something, it's automatically gets and stored in like a database queue that is ready made for all the friends. Let's say you have 100 friends. So this is being posted to 100 queues saying that these 100 guys, when they look at their feed, they're going to see your post. So this was a push system at that time in the very early days. This is basically what I'm calling what streaming, like sim streaming mm -hmm. systems. But what happened is that we figured out that this cannot scale, especially when the number of friends increase. And then there is relevant sorting, other things that happen when somebody wants to fetch his feed. So what we went to later on at Facebook was more a real-time system where when you post a comment, it gets stored in one place. It doesn't get pushed to all the feeds of your friends. Then when a friend joins or logs into his app, and refreshes the screen. At that time, a query goes to the back end and then does a gigantic query, but it has to be very fast again yeah, yeah, yeah. to find out all the feed of the of his friends that have posted, does a sorting and relevance matching, depends on uh, many other factors, and shows you only probably the top 10 feed or comments that you have, right? It cannot show you 10,000 posts that your friends have made. There's always a sorting and ranking algorithm. And this is the one that let actually Facebook scale to these billions of users now, right? You see what yeah. I'm saying? So the engagement just shot out the roof, shot, uh, shot through the roof because now you can see your most recent posts. It's not like the post was already ready-made for you one hour ago. And so you could see only the data that your friend posted an hour back if you were using a streaming system. So this yeah. is kind of the benefit uh, for that kind of scaling up Facebook to be more real time and less of the streaming part does it am i able to explain yeah, yeah. the difference between these two systems um, so so for for me so, so does that mean that when i mentioned this that it's the important part is getting to that information because it's not like a lot of information that you that you have in your timeline but getting to the right information at or sorting through the right information in the back end so that you then show this timeline that's the important part so getting quick to the data that you yes that you exactly yeah on display. and if you want like your latest data like data that got produced maybe three seconds ago then you all, always have to do some kind of a pulling query rather than like a push based query a lot so mm. streaming queries are mostly like push based right when new data arrives it pushes it to whoever is subscribed yeah. to this it scales only when the subscribers are few Right? When you have hundreds of subscribers to the feed, yeah. it's very difficult to scale this up. Uh, so again, like I said, streaming systems work well when you are generating reports, when you are generating periodic reports on data sets. You need a report every hour or you need a report every day. Those are great yeah. things for streaming system, you see. But when you're talking about real-time live analytics that somebody is uh, waiting uh, for some decision to happen before they can see something on their screen, interactive customer analytics those are very useful to do real time and uh, you get you can actually scale it to large set of users yeah, that makes sense mm. that's true okay yeah yeah for me it was because when i was when i was coming up and and uh it was actually the case that for instance there was coming data in there was analytics done and these analytics results then were for instance put on a dashboard immediately Right. Exactly. So it was exactly. already prepared data. It was not that the user queried and then a, a analytics process started it immediately and, and basically collected the right data. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Precisely. Yeah. Cool. I mean, nowadays yeah, you okay, also I... see some live dashboards sometimes, uh, right? So live dashboards, um, you can kind of uh, pick a lot of drop downs and query data mm -hmm. and the dashboard automatically changes as and when you are querying. So yeah. the new generation visualization tools are also appearing in the horizon, I think. Um, how was your experience with like Hadoop and other things? Like Hadoop did not have SQL in the very, very early days. Uh, when you were playing around with Hadoop, was that ever 
something that you thought about? Uh, not really. For for the for the case that I was working on, it was more like um, I was more working with uh, with HBase mm -hmm. and getting certain data out of certain regions in HBase fast and like yeah, basically yeah, HBase. Yeah, uh, basically H reading, reading, uh, how's it called? Re reading sequentially the data out that we that I needed for for the chops. Yeah, and that was the the big thing that I was I was working on, and with with files. A bit SQL. Sometimes it was necessary, but more than through Hive, that ah, uh, okay. connecting Hive through exactly. or basically creating a Hive warehouse and then connecting that to the data that was laying around. But that was never really. I don't know. It was it. It was more like a fix, and not not like I don't know some, something that that was meant for it. It, it felt for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hive. I remember Hive because Hive was also created by some of my colleagues at Facebook, right? It came mm -hmm. out of the Facebook backend. Again, open source code, uh, and it served its purpose in the sense Hadoop really got adoption because of Hive. Um, yeah. It is because made it easy for people to use. Like the moment your system has SQL, I think people just find it easy to use. Versus Hadoop had a MapReduce API. So I mean, how many people can learn some new MapReduce API and figure out how to run this code, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. That's SQL true. is and, quite and, useful. Yeah, and MapReduce was also was also like annoying to to use because you only had your map and reduce face and then you needed to store exactly. your data and pick it up again and like Ugh. exactly so, exactly yeah, that's true exactly i mean sql i think is kind of the great leveler in the sense if your data system if you're a data engineer and you want to make like uh, fast or how should i say uh, ship projects faster i think if your system has sql that is a great advantage uh, over time i uh, i also realized that SQL sometimes the power of SQL comes when there are joints um, allowed by SQL, right? Like Hive, you can actually join 10 different humongous data sets as part of the query, right? So when I'm evaluating a data system, uh, I usually look for if the data system has SQL and does the SQL support joints across different data sets? Because some people, so they're like, take for example, um, some key value stores have decided to layer SQL on top of it, but they don't support joints. So in mm -hmm. that case, you can just do select star. I mean, anybody can do kind of a select star query <laughs> yeah. uh, from a table. But if you do joints, that is when the power of the anal analytics system really shows up because almost every analytical query needs to correlate data from this data set with that data set and join them and then do it something That's else, true. right? That's true. Um, <laughs> Yeah, about let me let me add something before before I add something about the SQL. Um, I see a lot of people in the uh, in the, the chat uh, and in the stream. Uh, if you have any questions, put your questions in the in the uh, chat. We're going Dubai and I. We're going to take the questions most likely at the end, and then uh, we Dubai answers as much as possible. So don't yeah. be don't be shy. Just put in your your uh, your comments. Um, what do I want to say? Yeah, about SQL. I find it uh, I find it funny sometimes because I had a lot of students, and sometimes we were we were uh, talking about uh, time series databases, and there was the decision: okay, which time series database do we use? And I always uh, recommend Influx, for instance, as time series database because it's very easy to set up and, and nice to use. And a lot of like, I was doing like, uh, no, Influx doesn't support SQL queries. Uh, it only has Flux DB, uh, Flux uh, uh, language. And uh, I much rather take what's the other time scale or something, where I have SQL uh, query options. And that's 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 actually quite funny. But it's it shows it's true. If something has a SQL interface. It, it gets adopted. Yeah, it just like makes it. it easier to use, right? For time series databases, uh, like you mentioned, usually the only kind of the index is time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which basically means that when all your data comes in, um, you can, all your data is indexed by the time range. So maybe you don't need joins in some of this time series databases, but for most analytical like business apps that you're writing, for those, you definitely need like the join capability of SQL as well. Um, 
So HBase, you mentioned something about HBase earlier. HBase did not have SQL, right? It was a key value store um, back then, but it got adoption at that time because I think most people were still dealing with key value stores and they thought that if I have petabytes of data, I can't run SQL on it uh, because there was no such system. So they're all mm -hmm. happy with key value stores. But now in the last four or five years, you see a lot of SQL systems on large data sets. Yeah, it's that's true. But it, it, yeah, we have to say for key value stores, it's easy to work with the keys, right? It's oh, like, yes, absolutely. It's easy absolutely. to filter on a key or run a run a query on a key. It's it's, it's yes, it's very nice. It's nice. It's it has some upsides to it. Yeah, I can um, share you another story there. Now, suddenly I remembered when you talked about key value stores. Um, so again, a story from the Facebook backend, right? So what happened was that uh, Facebook has a very complex um, ad placement software, right? It's an analytical software. It's like which ads to show to which customer mm -hmm. at what time. It's very much analytical in nature, it, uh, but it has to be real time, right? It has to be immediate. Like when a customer logs in to Facebook, what ads to show to that person at that precise time. Yeah. So it used to run on an age based cluster. Um, a certain version, a certain portion of the workload, it used to run on like a 500 node age based cluster, right? With like, um, like maybe eight CPUs each. Uh, and then when I was building RocksDB, another key value store, again, nothing different from age base other than the performance. So when I was working with RocksDB, this was one of the first use cases where we tried to replace age base with RocksDB. And that 500 node age base cluster, we could shrink it to 32 node rocks to be cluster. Okay. So this is basically the, I feel this is kind of the, uh, what is it called? The, 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 the turning point for rocks to be people at Facebook realized that, Oh, this is really powerful because whatever I could do with 500 machines in age base. Now we can do it like 32 machines in rocks to be so. A lot of people started to use RocksDB at a time. Again, the focus for RocksDB was low latency queries, um, mm -hmm. which is why it could do so much more compared to older generation systems that we were using at the time. Uh, but again, all of these are key value stores, so no SQL yet on those. Um, and mm -hmm. people and developers still liked because they could just use the key value API and get their job done. Yeah, that's true. So for you then, you then made the jump to to Rockset, so you you were working on how how was that you were working on RocksDB and and other topics from the Facebook backend. Then you just decided to okay, let's let's do something different. Let's let's go more into the into the real time analytics um, topic. What, what was the yeah, um, what was the process? That's a good this? point. Yeah, I. Yeah, I saw a lot of use cases at Facebook, uh, which were very much real-time analytics, right? Like I explained, uh, the ad placement, it has to be real-time. You don't create a set of ads and keep it ready for Andreas, mm. another set of ads ready for Dhruba, right? They're not like pre can They're not streaming ads. They're actually real-time in the sense uh, when you log in, that's the time when you see the queries. Um, mm. So I did see a lot of real-time analytical apps. Another one was spam detection, right? So if you see spam happening, then um, like somebody posts a bad URL to Facebook, um, how can you, how quickly can you see how to quarantine that? Uh, how quickly can you see how to find bad URLs and quarantine? So these are all real-time analytical apps. Hmm. So this was kind of the inspiration um, for me going into Rockset and saying that, hey, these real-time ana analytical apps could be very useful for an enterprise user as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is when we started to build Rockset, uh, mostly focused on real-time anal analytics. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, the, but the cool thing is, and how, when I was playing with with the with the tutorial, what I liked on uh, uh, on Rockset that you can actually add the sources from all over the place. You can add something from AWS. You can add like 
from other platforms as well. So that was that 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 was one of the major goals for you then that you also saw on Facebook that it's not just a single a single source or that's a great point yes um typically a lot of the systems we saw like for example spam detection right so spam detection systems it has to look at signals from five different sources that's how you identify spam so yes it was very important for when we were building rockset it was very important for us to allow people or to allow to build tools that data engineers can use to bring in data from different sources like S3 or Kafka or Kinesis or um, maybe Azure systems or get data from Google systems and kind of join together um, and then build the analytical queries because you have to look at signals from many different sources. Also, usually these sources are in different data formats, right? Like as a data mm -hmm. engineer, sometimes I spend a lot of time converting uh, JSON or protobuf or um, XML or CSV files and all these formats of data. So Rockset also makes it easier for us, for a data engineer to get this data from different sources in different formats without actually writing a lot of lines of code. Uh, it's a kind of a low code uh, system where you can run a few lines of SQL queries and join data from to different sources into different formats. Uh, mm -hmm. Only thing you need to know is SQL. So this is again inspired by a lot of systems I saw uh, or I helped build at Facebook and Yahoo earlier. Mm -hmm. Was that was that back in the day a, a problem that uh, they had multiple data sources that were hard to integrate? Was that something that you that you saw? Yes, as a problem um, in in these companies. Yeah, that's a great point. So when I was at Facebook, uh, Facebook uses a logging system called Scribe. It's equivalent to like Kafka. It's again, an open source system, but it's similar to Kafka. And um, what happened was that data you, to the Facebook system used to come in from different sources, right? One is from the Facebook app. When you were using the app, it collecting logs and sending data to the back end to uh, for analytics, but then people also use Facebook on different devices using something like an API. So there are logs coming in from other systems as well. There are logs coming in from, uh, let's say there is a Facebook partner integration with um, eBay or some other integration with um, some Spotify or mm -hmm. something else. So all this data was coming in. And this was a, initially, it was a big challenge to get them all into one place. Uh, but our data warehouse, uh, at that time, a lot of stuff used to go into Hadoop at that time using Scribe. Um, but then again, things were not real time in the beginning. Like I said, the challenge was more about how can we convert all these data formats into something that is queryable. And it used to take many hours or sometimes days. Um, in the very early days, but over time, things have become more real time, like I mentioned. Um, nobody wants to deal with old data nowadays, stale data. It's like, um, yeah, so I, I usually compare this with like how we watch movies, right? Like early times, I used to go to the movie store to watch movies, um, right? Or movie theater, or I'll go buy a DVD from the store and put it in my DVD player. But now mm. it's all streaming. So I just switch on my TV and say, hey, stream me some stream me some new movies that are coming. So this is how data engineers also, I'm a data engineer and I feel like that I can't wait for one day to plan in advance what I'm going to do tomorrow. I need to kind of build my applications quickly. Uh, so the focus for a lot of the tools is how to make this easy to use and quick so that you don't have to plan a lot of things in advance. You don't have to create schemas in advance. You don't have to like do a lot of cleaning of the data before you can actually make sense out of it. So this is the trend I see from a lot of my data engineer friends um, adopting in, in, in real life. It's also, it's, it's coming very often these things come from the business, right? That somebody has a, this morning, somebody's coming in, I have a problem, I need this and this. Can you give me that uh, that answer? Can you can you set something up? 
and like you have to quickly quickly figure out how to solve this problem quickly how to get to the data how do you run the analytics on top of that so as you said it's not like you plan every day ahead exactly. sometimes it is like that if you have big uh, big projects with with timelines but for a lot of people they they need to run quick quick queries quick yeah solve quick problems um, exactly. Exactly. I, I, yeah. I mean, nobody wants scale data in general. Yeah, that's true. Um, I wrote this down a few minutes ago, and I, I forgot it three times now to to uh, to comment on that with the uh, with the ads and the real time uh, the, like serving of ads. I find this very very frightening sometimes. I had I had this. Uh, I think two days ago, we, my wife and I, we were talking about vacation and so on, and she was she was looking at some some destinations, and the next day I logged in on uh, on my computer and I was looking at uh, on a video, uh, I was watching a video on YouTube and it showed me a ad for vacation something vacation platforms, and like <laughs> it's this this stuff can be really can be frightening like. <laughs> But it's a cool use case. See, this us. happened one day after you searched. This yeah. happened one day after you searched, right? But sometimes it could happen instantaneously. Uh, like you search for it and then immediately you go to some other screen and you start seeing all vacation rental ads or something. Yeah, yeah. that could be. I had this. Really I had this with, with whiskey a few years ago, like like uh, two years ago or something. I was I was actually browsing for uh, my wife had a had a I don't know how you, how you call this. Like she, she when she was at the supermarket, they gave her a, a a sheet with with some whiskey, and I was looking. Okay, where can I get this? And I immediately got got the uh, the ads for it. It's like it's amazing. Yeah, uh, I think yeah, to what we were talking. Yeah, real-time systems and like what, machine learning models. Yeah, uh, uh, I think what we were talking about. Uh, there's an interesting question here. Um, SQL interface to to your data basically, and uh, one thing, and I, I need to ask you this. Um, there's an interesting question. We have a lot of different types of documents: uh, text, Word, Excel, scanned documents submitted by customers. We would like to get data out of these documents for analytics and search. What do you think uh, are possible tools that can help? I actually I would not have a good answer to that question because like. I have no experience with documents. I was always working like on that's I call it semi-structured data. Do you have some experience on that? What, what would be what would be an approach here? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Um, I have never seen one database which can say I can parse all Excel, all PDFs, all XML files, and give you data. Um, so you'd have to use a lot of open source software, I think, to do this at, uh, at small scale. But when you talk about large scale, um, I think there's no one solution that you can use. Uh, now, mm -hmm. I work at Rockset, and Rockset supports PDF and Excel, right? But again, when you're talking about eight different types of data formats, I'm pretty sure Rockset doesn't support all the data formats that mm -hmm. you would probably need. Um, so, so yeah, there's no, as far as I know, there's no one database that can give you everything. Um, and you'd have to use a lot of open source software to build it yourself. And by yeah. the way, there are a lot of open source software that can do this, right? Because these are nicely formatted documents and their formats are very standard. So you have open source binary or libraries to parse these documents. Does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I see it the same way. Because I I actually find this a bit funny. Back in the day, when with Hadoop and and these distributed file systems, one of the big selling points was you can drop in your files from everywhere, and then we're going to put them through the analytics, and this there's going to be you can do crazy stuff with it. But it was it was never this like okay, you have all these file types, and you can natively parse everything. So. Yeah, but it's, it's a, that was a good answer. Yeah, it's, there's a there's a lot of tools out there, and have to look at the what's what's there. Um, 
what do we want to talk about? Uh, one thing I was experiencing and what I really liked with the rock set, and I, I also uh, talked about that in the video, is that very often you have a you have a tool where you can or a database where you can access your data, where you can write SQL queries, but do you really want to connect to the database directly and and write SQL queries? Very often you want to have some sort of an API layer in between, right? So that your front end does not directly need to connect to your database and you have that security. Or if somebody writes a Python app, you can directly connect, uh, you can use an API and not have to directly connect to the to the database. I found that really a cool approach uh, that yeah, makes it makes a lot of yeah stuff easier so how was the how was the like yeah. how did you come up with this <laughs> yeah that's a great point so rockset uh, we think about rockset as a real-time anal analytical platform right so not just a database that rockset is which basically means that uh, how can we make sure that people can maybe use rockset without using some custom binaries or libraries on their application, right? So Rockset essentially exposes SQL queries as a REST API. It's called Query Lambdas. So mm -hmm. we came up with this uh, invention called Query Lambdas. So what a user or a data engineer does is that he looks at all the data and he creates some SQL queries and he creates a Query Lambda for that SQL query and parks it inside the Rockset uh, platform. And now your application developers uh, they can just hit the query lambda without knowing even what the SQL is inside it, right? Using standard REST APIs. So if you're using standard REST APIs to query Rockset, you don't need an SDK. You don't need some other library to be linked in with your app. You can just straight away make uh, SQL queries over REST and the query lambda executes in the backend, runs the SQL query and gives you results back to the, to the application developer. So again, this is a tool that uh, is super relevant for data engineers, right? So if you're looking at a data platform, see if you can, if the data platform exposes something like this so that it makes the life of your application developers easy and fast. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> what other um, tools um, come close in this area? Do you have any other I, things that you might have seen in this area? I think, Andrea? yeah, Elasticsearch, I think they have, uh, they have a, uh, like an API way of, of uh, accessing Elasticsearch, right? But Yes, so yeah. Elastic, uh, the, yeah, the, the difference again, I think is that Elasticsearch is a great piece of software. Uh, it's open source and you can run it to do indexing. Uh, the challenge though is about SQL. Right, so if you, the Elasticsearch has their own API of how to yeah, query data. So you'd have to learn that. Um, that, that is a little <laughs> bit challenging in the beginning, right? Uh, and other difference for, from analytics is that uh, analytical, like I said, analytics needs joining of two large data sets. Uh, how can you join two different data sets so you can get intelligence out of it? And Elastic, really there's no way to join two large data sets with Mm. group by order by relevance matching sorting these kind of higher level primitives so so yeah again uh, for rockset itself a lot of our users have an elastic uh, search background in the sense they use elastic and then they're doing analytics mm. and then they decide to use rockset sometimes because uh, they find rockset so much easy to use and fast um, compared to what elastic was yeah. earlier so, also the also, the use case for Elastic is quite narrow, right? It's, it's as you said, we, we have to think of it a bit different. Rockset is more a platform, not not just a database. So, and Elasticsearch is basically just a search engine. So it it, it has a very well defined and very very uh, thin, no, no yeah. narrow. It's yeah. more narrow use case. Exactly. Right? Uh, we uh, we're dancing. Yeah, we, Elasticsearch we, very much. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, I was just trying to um, throw a little bit more color there. So Elasticsearch, like you said, great software. It is mostly developed to search on large texts. 
like when you have a lot of texts, large text data sets, uh, it was designed there. Whereas for Rockset, because you have SQL and joins, it's a search database, which basically means that you can actually do analytics uh, using the search database in Rockset. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. You were about to say something. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I was just saying, uh, uh, wanted to say is we're dancing a bit around this question here from someone in the chat, and I, this is a good, good uh, time to bring it on. Uh, does Rockset also perform real-time in-place analytics from underlying data lakes like S3, Azure Data Lake, with uh, no data movement, similar to Presto, as a query accelerator? So, accessing external external yeah. sources. Uh, can you talk a bit about this more? Great because question. I was yeah. also asking this uh, earlier. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, Rockset is not a query feder federation. So Presto is a query federation system, which basically means that when a query comes to Presto, it fans that query to the underlying data sources, and get results from them, and then re returns uh, results. So if you're using Presto, you are always at the mercy of how fast those backend systems are because every query hits all the sources of your data. So Rockset, that's not the case. It's not a query federation. So when, it, when, Rocks, when you connect a data source from S3 to Rockset, Rockset actually builds an index out of the data in S3, right? And it's a covering index. In database terminology, it's called a covering index, which basically means that it covers all the data that was in S3. And when a query comes in, it uses the index to re respond to the query, but it doesn't have to go back to the S3 to fetch more data. Because it has built a covering index, all the data is already in Rockset to serve these queries. So this is why Rockset can guarantee you queries finishing in 50 milliseconds, whatever, 100 milliseconds, because it is not depending on how fast the backend data systems are. Like take, for example, if you're running query on S3, it could be slow sometimes because latencies on S3 are many hundreds of milliseconds at the best. So yeah, so it's, Rockset is very different from Presto. It's when a query comes to Rockset, it doesn't have to go back to the data sources. It has a covering index and all queries are answered using the covering index that is on Rockset. So Rockset uses RocksDB internally, the open source RocksDB database, which is why it can answer this queries very quickly at millisecond latency response times. Mm -hmm. Does it answer your question, yeah, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope uh, LinkedIn user, right? If that also, I'm guessing this this is uh, this answering this question for this person as well. Um, we're going to let's let's jump in a, into a few more questions, Druba. Uh, I think, yeah, I think these all are very interesting to to talk about here in the in the Rockset um, uh, realm or uh, from from your view here. Uh, no, this was the wrong one. Sorry. Yeah, I, Rockset um, definitely. The, the one thing that I wanted to emphasize with our all our data engineering friend engineer friends is that uh, Rockset internally uses the open source RocksDB database. So that's kind of the storage engine that powers the fast queries. Mm -hmm. So if you're using, you could use RocksDB yourself, but it's a key value store, um, right? So the, the, the benefit of using Rockset is that you can get SQL queries to, to this data set and you can actually join different data sets uh, at query time versus mm -hmm. using a key value store and then setting it up yourself to do higher level abstractions yourself. You could just rely on SQL to do it for you. So this is the power of the Rockset platform. <clears throat> cool. Hmm. Um, could you guys talk about how to set up the infrastructure for big data processing nowadays? Uh, do people in the industry proven uh, provision servers and install Spark Kafka, or do they uh, rely on AWS Azure now? So, from your from your point of view, from Rockset, what I have seen is you are provisioning um, you're provisioning basically uh, compute instances in the background, right? Yes, so it's automatic for you. It's a, so this is what I mean by, uh, for us data engineers, I think, what does the term serverless mean to us, right? To me, as a data engineer, serverless means that uh, the, the platform still uses servers, obviously, inside it, right? But 
as a user of the platform, you don't have to configure any servers or configure any storage devices or you configure mm -hmm. any memory. You just say that, oh, I have this 10, 000, 10 million records or 100 billion records. I want to store it in a data system. So I just store it and automatically the system provisions the servers for you and grows. And then you can, and when you make queries, you can say that I want fast queries, then the system will, is going to give you some amount of compute that you can do. And you can also say, I need more compute to make my queries faster. But yes, um, this is the age of serverless. I think uh, if you're if you're using a data system where you have to configure um, machines and servers, it just slows you down, right? Um, but a lot of the serverless platforms that are out there, they do it for on your behalf. You still have full control as a data engineer. Um, you can set limits, capacities, these kind of things. But you don't have to worry about oh, which. Um, uh, like which uh, availability zone should I get this machine? How do I connect mm -hmm. it to, what is the networking that I need to do? You don't need to worry about this. This is, uh, this is what the data platform does for you. Um, again, this is kind of the difference between older generations data systems and new ones, right? Like take, for example, you might be familiar with say Elastic, of course, you already mentioned, right? And Apache Druid and Apache Kafka. These were kind of built in a time when Cloud wasn't there, right? So we had to, mm -hmm. as a data engineer, I had to go provision all the nodes and set up the Kafka brokers, uh, those kind of things. Um, but like I said, the new age ones that are on the cloud, they're all uh, the equivalent systems that we have, they're all serverless, especially take, for example, Rockset. Uh, it's completely serverless platform. You just deposit data and make SQL queries on, the, on, this, on this data set. But you, how is that? I, don't, I need to think back. How did I do that? So, you, but you need to, at some point, you need to define that uh, you want to run your whole rock set on a, on a certain amount of, 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 I don't call it, I don't know how you call it, nodes or, or a compute okay. instance or something. Great point. Yeah, right. great point. So, rock set has this thing called virtual instance, right? It's not really a machine, but it, mm. but it lets the user say that. I want to uh, make these queries. So, you, so different applications need different query latencies, right? Some guys, some applications might need 10 millisecond query latency. Some other mm -hmm. applications might be okay with one second query latency. So you could tell Rockset saying that, hey, I want to run this on a large virtual instance, which basically means there are more compute. And so your query latencies will automatically come down. Um, but if you're okay with slower queries or the one second queries, you can say that, hey, I, I could run it with a smaller virtual instance size. It's like your t-shirt sizes, right? Um, you know what I'm saying? If you're jogging, you mm -hmm. might need a t-shirt, which is very airy. Whereas if you are sitting in a very cold place, you might want to wear a different t-shirt. Yeah, That's so. the kind of APIs that uh, Rockset has. You don't have to configure servers. You just need to tell uh, how fast essentially your queries would need to be because then you need more compute to make the yeah, queries yeah. faster. Uh, makes um, sense. Okay. So then basically that's also the answer how I would say to our to this to this question. You don't go around and set up infrastructure nowadays. Correct. It doesn't matter I would say most of the platforms don't need to do, you don't need to do this. They have or some sort of services where you don't need to set a set. So that's bring up Andrew, the I think unfortunately that's not true yet, right? Most systems still need to set up uh, servers because they were like I said when you when you have when you're running a software system that was built in 2008, right? Well, some of mm. these open source databases they were not built for the cloud. So you mm. still have to go to the cloud system and say, hey, I need five servers of this type and I need 10 servers of other type and run. Yeah. Um, but I think most people are trending in the direction where they want to do serverless, right? Yeah. So as a data engineer, my thinking always is that if there's a serverless platform, I'd rather use that versus one where I have to set up That's servers true. by myself. That's true. Yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking along the lines of uh, AWS Kinesis or um, DynamoDB, where you say, okay, I, I need this throughput, give me these amounts of shards, and that's it. 
you don't have that's to worry also. about it and it's basically the same thing as you said with that's Rockset, also. where you have to yeah. okay i need this this uh, this amount of or this speed give me these general these compute instance and then you don't have that's to worry also. about this you that's right also. yeah yeah it's all service so this that's the trend that's going and that's also a case like we said earlier nowadays who is using hadoop in new new installations yeah it's 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 getting hard to uh, uh, to uh, yeah so this is one of the reasons why i think hadoop is kind of dying a slow death right because uh, it was it was an open source software uh, it's not the best software to run to make it cloud friendly mm -hmm. and the same thing with like say like i said apache uh, Druid, uh, some people might be using something called ClickHouse. Some people might be using things like um, um, so, 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 so. what I'm trying to say is that these systems, I think, unlike DynamoDB and Kinesis, which were born only on the cloud, right? You cannot mm -hmm. download Kinesis and run it yourself. So when you're talking about older generation open source software, they have made a lot of this trade off, engineering trade offs, why um, systems don't scale up and scale down very quickly. Right, like take for example, if you're doing Elastic, uh, there is no code there right now where more Elastic nodes will join the cluster when you have more load. That is code outside of Elastic you have to write. Mm. Um, some people use Kubernetes. I think Kubernetes has become more and more popular uh, in a lot of our data platforms. Rockset also runs on Kubernetes. Um, that those are the technologies kind of to get married together so that these things can become very cloud friendly and move up and down uh, when there's more load. Um, yet another thing I noticed is that a very few platforms actually shed data when shed or shed hardware when it's not in use. So, but this mm. great system, these things are done very well with Dynamo and Kinesis. You are absolutely right. Um, that's a question. This is a kind of specific, but I, I think that's interesting for people. How does Roxet charge the customers then? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, um, this is not based on servers, right? Because Rockset is a serverless platform. It cannot be say that, oh, I give you 10 servers, so I charge you this much money. Mm. So the pricing model for Rockset is based on usage, which basically means that um, Rockset separates the compute from the storage. So the charge both these two things separately. So there is a price, unit price for the storage for every gigabyte of data you might uh, spend a few cents and then for uh, for the compute depending on the, how many what t-shirt size virtual instances you are buying in Rockset, you get a different unit price and the price is per second which mm -hmm. basically means that the moment you start using it you get charged and the moment you don't use it you don't get charged it's not like you buy up front and you keep it it's not like a machine that you buy and you keep it in your mm -hmm. data center for the next one month or next one year so the pricing is again very much um, separated out by unit price for compute and a unit price for storage. Um, yeah. Again, this is possible because Rockset is a disaggregator architecture, right? Like we use something called the aggregator leaf Taylor architecture, and it lets you scale. Rockset automatically scales compute and storage separately. Mm -hmm. um, again, unlike traditional open source databases where these things usually are tied together. Uh, mm -hmm. where the storage nodes have to have compute together, whereas for Rockset, they're separated out. This is why I mean by these are native cloud native systems. We want to build disaggregated so that we can, somebody might need a lot of compute, but other guy might have a lot of storage and we don't want yeah. to put extra cost in the system. Yeah. There was also something that, that was always annoying. You have, you set up your cluster, you, you provisioned your instances, and if you don't use them, they're going to cost you whatever, right? They're, right. They run for the day. <laughs> You're going yes. to pay for the day. So it's, yeah. it's not very flexible. No. So uh, this, is, this is good. Yeah, for cloud systems like Dynamo, I think of Kinesis and Rockset. Like if you don't use it, uh, you can save a lot of money for yeah. the times you're not using it. Yeah. Um, the other let's let's see how you answer this and then that, that interests me here um in what situation would you actually turn away from serverless you we're both coming from the serverless uh, from the from the provisioning as to to preference this 
I find it very difficult nowadays. So what, 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 what would be your... <laughs> That's a good answer? question. I've never been asked this question, so I'm trying to understand if there's a use case where serverless doesn't help. Um, um, it's possible that maybe you have already bought a lot of hardware, um, right? And you want to deprecate it for the next three to five years, then obviously you might want to make sure that you can use the resources you already bought and not mm -hmm. go to a new serverless platform. That's the only thinking I have, uh, I have in mind. It's like as if uh, you have stocked a lot of food in your fridge and you don't want to buy more food unless and until you finish all the food that you have in your own fridge. Uh, I can't really think about why serverless uh, won't be good for a use case. Um, yeah, I really don't think there are use cases where serverless is not helpful. The the only thing that I that I think, or th I think two things here are interest or uh, could be if you're not allowed to up upload this data to the cloud, like it's oh, some yes. sensitive okay. data, right? That you're sure. that you're not allowed. And if you're, if you're, it, but this depends on the use case. Let's say you have a, you have a factory and in the factory you're generating a lot of data and you can actually not offload this to the cloud. It's from a volume size. It's, it's literally not possible. And you could, got it, then got you it, could yeah. argue, do you really need everything? And do, could you use partial data that you use software? As a, so, yeah. I think we I both see. agree it's it's yeah, very right. difficult to to argue the other way around we're because it's so good yeah no i did not understand your question i think what you asked is 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 the cloud useful for some use cases yeah cloud is not useful for some use cases right yeah but serverless is kind of a subset of all the cloud users mm. uh, so That's true. i got confused now i understand yeah cloud is not useful for many use cases like if yeah. it's, especially if you're doing edge computing or your devices or factory floors yeah it doesn't make sense to send all of those things to the cloud yeah that that's that's more how i understand this and not like completely serverless but the whole like setting something up on in the cloud fair yeah that makes sense um i start something else um We're already very late. Do you have? Let's let's not let's not take another question we, because we're already an hour in. I see. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, Druva. Uh, something. Do Do you want to add something before we close here? I, I, it was a really nice talk. I, I think uh, we both coming from the engineering side. It's 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 nice to have to talk with somebody who, who understands you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for letting me talk to your audience. Uh, I was here mostly to help answer questions from data engineers. So if more data engineers have questions as follow ups, um, if there's a way for them to ask me those, that'll be great. Um, maybe they go to your it, website can, or something. Can they where can they find you? Drew? Yeah, so I am definitely on LinkedIn. So you can send me a LinkedIn request. Um, that's the best place, I think. You can also find me at some places in rockset.com. Uh, I think there's a link there, rockset.com. You can try there as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the best place for you to connect with me would be to go to the LinkedIn uh, and connect with me and ask me questions. Um, yeah. It'll be exciting to talk to more people. Let, let's see. We can also... Um, I'm going to... How can we do this? Maybe uh, because I'm going to post about this in the uh, that the recording is up. Got it. If uh, for anybody in the uh, for everybody in the chat, if you then go there also and post it there, uh, Druba, if you have time or somebody yes, from I your will. team has time, yes, it would be cool to just absolutely uh, get in there and have some yeah, fun. absolutely. Sounds yeah. great. It was really nice, as I said, Druba. The I find the Rockset platform very interesting. I that's why I so let let's do, let's try to to find some yeah. time. Hopefully, I, uh, for me it was really cool getting you here yeah. on the line. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping some of your audience can go to rockset.com and try out our free uh, account. Uh, if you have small size of data and you want to just play around with it, please create a free account and try it. You can get real time analytics at your fingertips. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. It, it's free. I I made a video uh, on my YouTube channel where I go through the through the tutorial. So uh, for anybody in the chat, if if you wanna uh, list, uh, look at that before, you can also look at that before and then go in. I find it cool that it's that it's for free. I think it's a nice uh, and I nice start. I ah, Nadine here posted the the link in the chat. I think or currently. Oh no, that's the data sources. But you find it here, Roxette.com. Okay. Drew, thank you very much for being here. It was really nice talking to you. Uh, yeah, let's finish this. Uh, have a great thank day, you. Druba, and everybody in the chat, everybody who's listening to this. Bye bye. Yeah, see thank you later. You. Bye.